Good morning. My name is Corey Arnold, and I am the Minister of Youth here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. I have a few announcements to share with you. The May edition of Table Talk Magazine is available in the plastic bin outside of the main entrance to the church, as well as some additional resources that are typically available in the entryway. Please come by and pick up these materials. Fireside Chats will continue on Tuesday and Friday this week, along with the virtual prayer and TFC meetings on Wednesday. Please look for those postings and plan to join those meetings. Allow this to be a reminder to remove any distractions so we can worship our great God. As you're removing distractions, let's join in with, for the call to worship this morning. That will be from Psalm 145, verses 8 through 10. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. Let's pray. Lord, we come to worship you, for you are so good. You're gracious and merciful, and your mercy covers all that you have made. You alone are worthy of our worship. We thank you for your mercy and goodness towards us. Allow our words and songs to be acceptable to you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I'm Pastor Tim, the assistant pastor here. I'm going to be reading our scripture reading this morning, which comes to us from Matthew chapter 16. I encourage you to turn in your Bibles there and join me. It's Matthew chapter 16, and we will be starting in verse 13 and reading the text of our passage, which will go through verse 20. Follow along as I read. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you and we are so thankful. We are thankful people because we know that the declaration that we have just read is true, that Jesus is the Christ. He is the promised one who would come to be the king of your people. Lord, we are so thankful that he did in fact come and that he gave his life as a ransom for many. And we thank you for the promises that he will return again for those who trust in him. Lord, we are reminded in this passage of, of the trust that the disciples had in you. We pray that this trust would be the same in us, that we would put our whole faith and trust in you. Lord, this is a difficult time that we have been living in. We have been out of our routines for, for two months now. We have been disrupted in life, and worse than that, by, by far, are the people that we have seen who have been sick and dying around us. Lord, things are difficult. Things are hard for us, and so we come to you, and we know that, that you are our rock. We hear the promises repeated from the Old Testament and in the book of Psalms that you are a rock, a fortress for your people where we can come and we can receive comfort in time of need. And so we pray that this morning, Lord. We pray that for the people of this church, for the people of this world. For there are so many who are hurting, so many who are in mourning at the loss of loved ones, at those who have died. And Lord, we, we cannot comfort them the way that we like to. We cannot be with them and, and offer them our shoulder to cry on and so we pray that you would be the God of all comfort to them and that they would come to trust you and, and rest in you 
in a, in a more profound way now than, than ever before. Lord, there are so many people in this church who, who are uh, dealing with, with many pressures, the pressures of, pressures of not being able to make an income because of a loss of a job, or maybe the pressures of, of being overworked at their place of employment. There are pressures that come along with changes to family routines, and so we pray, Lord, that you would, that you would come and you would give grace and, and that you would help us that you would help us to serve you and to know what that looks like in these times. For those that uh, have been negatively affected and and whose whose livelihoods and and health have been taken away at this time, Lord, we pray for comfort for them. We pray that we as the church, as as the people of the church, would reach out to them and would help them in whatever ways that we can. Lord, we also pray for, for this world. There are so many people who are in great need so we think of uh, the governments, we think of healthcare professionals and, and those who, who are in charge and have been given great responsibility. Lord, we pray that you would give them wisdom. We pray that you would give them insight. We pray also that your word would go forth. We do not simply pray that people uh, would recover. We, we do pray that, Lord. We pray that you would take this illness away. But we pray that you would use even these negative circumstances, even the bad things that happen, to show people who you are and that lives would be changed for eternity as a result. We pray all this, trusting in your holy and precious name. Amen. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we have this wonderful opportunity to study your word. Your word has power. It is alive. And I pray, Lord, that it would be alive to us, that it would achieve the purposes for which you send it. So send your word out with power this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. This morning, we're going to embark upon a new series called The Permanent prevailing church. What is the church to be? What are Jesus' plans and purposes for his church? These are things that are not just important, but absolutely necessary for us to know as Christian believers, because when God saves sinners, he saves them into the church. Now, what does that look like? And what is the church anyway? What is the church to be And how do we fit into it as individual men and women, boys and girls? Well, we're going to find answers to many of these questions as we study the first two chapters in the book of Acts. But this morning, I want us to go back even further, because even before the church was established, our Lord gave us a sneak preview in Matthew 16 in the passage that Pastor Tim has just read for us. In Matthew 16, Jesus describes for us in some detail the enduring nature of his church. And you can get a great picture of what's happening here as this this section proceeds. Jesus takes his disciples into Caesarea Philippi. It's a community about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. It is a Gentile community. It's a pagan place filled with pagan idolatry. While in Jesus' time it was named for the Roman emperor Caesar and Herod Philip, also known as Philip the Tetrarch, who was the son of Herod the Great, who served as the puppet ruler of Galilee, originally it bore another name. It was called Peneus in honor of the Greek god Pan. Pan was a half-man, half-goat deity who was considered to be the god of nature, the god of wooded areas, the god of pasture lands. And in earlier days... There was in Caesarea Philippi a cave filled with water and a precipice on top. And these pagan believers would actually throw live children down into the entrance of the cave. They would make living sacrifices of them. That cave bore a name. It was called the Gates of Hades. So you can imagine, this is where Jesus brings his disciples to teach them an important lesson about God's kingdom and the power and authority that's at the heart of that kingdom. It's here, at a, in a place where that 
where his disciples were probably intensely uncomfortable as they're surrounded by pagan shrines. It's here that Jesus asks a question. At this point, he's been working with his disciples, teaching them, preparing them for future ministry for maybe two and a half years. Many times they had observed as Jesus taught crowds, numbering into the thousands. And at this point, the Lord asked them a question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they give him all sorts of answers. Some say John the Baptist. Do you know who believed that? Herod Antipas, the brother of Philip the Tetrarch. It was Herod who had John beheaded at the request of his wife and daughter when John proclaimed that it was unlawful for Herod to take Herodias as his wife. Herodias was the wife of Philip the Tetrarch. In Matthew 14, 2, hearing about Jesus' fame, it was Herod Antipas who declared, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. So as, as Jesus hears the answer, some say John the Baptist, it's that kind of response. And, and John the Baptist was a great man. But Jesus is not John resurrected. John was right when he said of Jesus, he is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Likewise, we hear other names, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. They are all good and godly men, but they are mere shadows compared to the glory of the Lord Jesus. But this is what people believed. Even as they heard Jesus teach and saw him heal, and even bring people back from the dead. What a reminder that even today, people have all sorts of ideas concerning Jesus. There's no clarity, no unity in what they decide. And what is often said about Jesus would almost be comical if it were not so tragic. It's no wonder that in verse 20, Jesus charges his disciples not to tell anyone that he's the Christ. At this point, they wouldn't have correctly understood Jesus already knows what the masses believe concerning him. Now he wants to hear from the disciples what they believe. And so he asks, but who do you say that I am? My friends, this is at the heart of everything in any age. What do we believe about Jesus? And by the word believe, our Lord is asking for more than just mental agreement. Like, for instance, what we believe about George Washington and the cherry tree. You can believe that he chopped down his father's cherry tree when he was just six years old. Now, the official word from the National Park Service is that nobody knows for sure whether that's true or not. But whether you believe it or not, you're not staking your life on such a thing. It's just a tidbit of information, not a life-changing truth. But this... This is different. For what we believe about the Lord Jesus will determine how we live our lives and how we will spend and where we will spend eternity. It's imagined by many that what Simon Peter says, he says as a spokesman for the disciples as a group. Probably they huddled together and then pushed forward Peter, who was the natural leader of the group, and Peter spoke for them as a group. And what he exclaimed, and this is an exclamation, it's not something said with cool detachment. What he exclaimed is the absolute truth of who Jesus is. When he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It's a perfect statement of trust stated by an imperfect follower of Jesus. But it is the absolute truth. And it's at the heart of Christianity. The church, whatever it is, is based entirely on the belief that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. This foundation rests on the fact that Jesus is the long-promised Savior of a people, that he, as God's only Son, very God of very God, has saved for himself and has redeemed by his own precious blood. This is such an amazing passage about the church that Christ is building as the community of his blood-bought people. It is rich. It is controversial in the sense that people have been arguing about what Jesus meant by what he says here for centuries. And it is at the heart of who we are here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. It's just a, a tiny part of the greater entity that is the church. When we understand this text properly, we begin to see who we are and what God wants for us as a congregation. 
So what I'd like to do in our time together is to pursue understanding by the root of looking at just four words. Three of them actually appear right in the text itself. The fourth is what we call what Peter actually said. So here are the words. Confession, and then rock, gates, and keys. Confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Romans 10, 9, the Apostle Paul wrote, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is what Peter is confessing in verse 16, that Jesus is the Savior that God has sent and that he is himself God. Jesus is deity. He is Lord, and this is what we need to say with our mouths, but believe also in our hearts. What we believe on the inside needs to be stated by, a lip, by our lips on a consistent basis. This is who I am. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my God. I believe the gospel, that Jesus came, that he died for my sins, and that I am forgiven because of his work on the cross. No lesser confession will do. Jesus is not just a teacher, a healer, or a miracle worker. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Only that confession will result in salvation because for us to be saved, we must believe in the right Jesus. Now, how do we come to that point? where we understand correctly who he is and are willing to believe this about Jesus and then to speak so freely and enthusiastically of him. Well, Jesus tells us here. He congratulates Peter for his confession. He says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of John or Jonah. And Peter is blessed for his very overt confession of the truth about Jesus. Not just because he says the words and get, gets it right, but because despite all his failures and all Peter's imperfections, this is what Peter really believes about Jesus. He doesn't get it all yet. He won't get it all yet until after the resurrection, but he gets enough. And Jesus commends Peter for giving clear evidence of a real work of God in his life. But that's really the point. It's God who is at work in Peter making possible Peter's confession of the truth about Jesus. So note what follows in verse 16. For Jesus says, For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. How is it that Peter was able to give this great confession? Not because Peter is perceptive, or because Peter has an intelligence many others don't have. It's, it's easy to draw that conclusion even based on what we read here. For many others had heard Jesus teach, they had seen Jesus heal, they saw him work miracles, and yet they come away thinking that Jesus is John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. On the other hand, Peter, with a closer relationship with Jesus, but with some of, and much of the same data that they had, declares that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Wow, Peter, you must surely be sharp to get what so many others missed, right? But no, that's not it. Peter doesn't see with clear eyes because of Peter. Peter sees clearly because God has opened his eyes. It's not flesh and blood, Peter himself, that brought Simon Peter to this conviction about Jesus. Peter's faith in Jesus is the work of God, not the work of Peter, even though Peter really believes what he believes about Jesus. My friends, without God's work, the gospel is pure gibberish to people. It's foolishness. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. He writes, the natural person, that is, the person without eyes opened by God, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they're folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned, as in of the Holy Spirit, as in God opening the eyes of people. And this is hard for us to admit that we believe in Jesus because God gives us the faith to believe is a gift, but it is right here. The way salvation works for Peter is the same way salvation works for any one of us. And yes, it's hard because it's part of our hard wiring to want to say, I did this, I deserve credit for it. 
Years ago, during a re-election campaign speech in Virginia, the sitting U.S. president said, if you've got a business, you didn't build that. And he was roundly criticized because it was surmised that he was saying that people don't deserve credit for their own hard work, and everybody rose up in arms against him. But isn't that our natural inclination? I believe in Jesus because I myself came to that conclusion. But salvation, Jesus is telling Peter, and he's telling us, is a true work of God's grace. I believe, you believe, anyone who trusts in Christ believes because God opened our eyes so that we could see the beauty and the glory and the majesty and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners. Faith is a gift like salvation is a gift. And that does rest securely right alongside our own personal professions of faith. Here Peter is declaring what he really believes with all of his heart. And yet at the same time, the truth about Jesus was revealed to Peter by God. Rock. See verse 18. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Before we get to Peter's role in all of this, it's important to see what Jesus says about the church. He says it clearly. It is his church, and he is building it. Now, what is this church that our Lord Jesus is building? The answer is found in the word church. It's a word that Jesus uses only twice in the Gospels, here and in Matthew 18, verse 17, but it is used throughout the rest of the New Testament, and so we see that it is important that the church is what Jesus is building. The church is his program for the furtherance of his kingdom, and it is his plan for the growth and strengthening of his people. Now, the word church here is the Greek word ekklesia, which is the translation of the Hebrew word kahal, Ecclesia has a simple meaning, really, it's quite simple, congregation or assembly or even community. But when we think of the church, that word, we need to understand that church is a word that comes to us with centuries of layering that is drawn not from ecclesia, but originally from another Greek word, kuriake, which means house of the Lord. Kuriake evolved over time to kirika and Kirka, and finally church. And along the centuries, it, it picked up the meaning of a, of a building you know, and even an organizational structure. But that's not what Jesus means by it here. He says he is building his assembly. He's building his congregation. He's building his community of people. When Jesus says, I will build my church, he is telling us that he will build his congregation who will assemble together as his people and they will represent him. It is a landless kingdom made up of everyone who confesses Jesus as Peter confesses him. They live for him and follow him as part of the kingdom wherever they are, but especially when they're gathered together. Wherever Jesus' blood-bought people are together, that's the church. I love this analogy given by Jonathan Lehman. He says this ecclesia is kind of like the U.S. Embassy in London. If you go to London, you have officially left the United States, and you've crossed an ocean, and you're in the United Kingdom. But walk inside the embassy, and they will tell you that you are standing on American soil. So the idea here is that Christ is building his church, and he's building it on enemy soil. Now, what, in what sense is Peter the rock upon which our Lord is building that kind of ecclesia? Well, many things have been said, written, and believed over the centuries. The church in Rome says that what Jesus is doing here is establishing a line of succession that starts with Peter as the first pope, that Peter is the first in a line of men whose decisions are infallible and who rule over millions of believers. I, I have to be honest, I, I find that hard to take seriously when just a few verses later, Jesus takes Peter aside and says to him, get behind me, Satan, because Peter opposes Jesus' talk about being killed and raised on the third day. At that point, Peter is not a rock of building, but he is what the New Testament calls a stone of stumbling or a rock of offense. Now, if that's not what Jesus is saying, 
what then is he saying? And how does Peter fit into that? Well, Jesus is using building terminology. The church isn't a building, but Jesus is nevertheless building his church. And Peter's part of that. Peter, when he declares the gospel, as he's going to do in amazing ways, we're going to see in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. Peter, when he makes confessions like he does here about Jesus. Peter, when he preaches at Pentecost, Peter is doing something essential. Peter's name, we must remember, means rock. And there's an interesting play on words here. Peter is Petros in Greek. The word rock here in verse 18 is Petra, but they're linked. The rock, Peter, and the rock on which Jesus is building his church. Part of that rock is Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ. Part of it is also Peter and others like him, the apostles as a group and faithful ministers of the gospel and faithful witnesses to Jesus Christ. They're all construction stones in what our Lord is building. They are instruments that Jesus uses in the building of his church. If you don't believe that, I, want you, I invite you to turn on your own to Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 21, and follow the building analogy that the Apostle Paul uses when he talks about those who have been brought to saving faith. He talks of them as members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So Peter, we'll see in the book of Acts, was an important stone in the church that Jesus is building. You look at any one of the first 12 chapters of Acts, and Peter is a central figure, and he was mightily used, especially at Pentecost, when he preaches a sermon that God uses to bring 3,000 souls into the church on a single day. Peter didn't build the church, and the church does not belong to Peter. Peter is not the foundation of the church. Jesus is. It is the Lord's church. But our Lord is using the likes of Peter. And Peter correctly understood that that work continues, and that Jesus is even using the likes of us in the building of his assembly, his congregation, his people. Listen to Peter's own words written years later. In 1 Peter 2, verse 5, Peter writes, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We ourselves, even you, even me, are living stones that are being built into the church that Jesus is building, and it's indestructible. Gates. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Imagine Jesus saying these words as his disciples looked over the cave that was called the gates of Hades, where many children had been thrown to their deaths. What a word picture for the truth that he conveyed. Now, what did Jesus mean by the gates of hell? There are a lot of thoughts, and many of them are worthy of consideration. In a citadel, for instance, the gates were often the most strongly defended point. Now, this would suggest that the church is attacking, but the language of prevailing suggests that the offense and defense and that we will withstand another's attack. Others believe that the gates of hell is simply Jesus employing a Hebrew idiom for death, that death will not prevail over the church that Jesus is building. Or perhaps we need to see that the gates are that place where plans are made. It often it worked that way in the ancient world. At the gates, plans would be made and strategies would be formed. Ian Hamilton calls this the organized powers of darkness. The organized powers of evil and of darkness will not prevail against Christ church. Which one is it? I would say, my friends, let's not quibble. The point, though, is this. The enemy of our souls will not win. Satan and his powers of evil and malevolence will not overcome the church that Jesus Christ himself is building. Martin Luther put it this way. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, 
For God hath willed his truth to triumph through us, through the church. Not even the gates of hell will defeat the work that Jesus is doing in his church. And the disciples, as they looked over imposing and fearful pagan sites, they needed to know this. So do we living in a no less pagan world. Keys. We see reference here to keys in verse 19. As Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. How do we understand this? Well, it's simple. What does a key do? It locks or unlocks a door. Did Jesus give Peter the keys? Absolutely. Well, then when did Peter wield them? For sure at Pentecost, when Peter preached Jesus as the crucified, risen Messiah, and thousands cried out in response, Brothers, what shall we do? When Peter preached his Pentecost sermon, and when he answered their question with, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, at that moment, Peter was using the keys that Jesus had given him. For the 3,000 who repented and trusted in Jesus Christ, to them the keys unlocked and unloosed the doors of heaven, granting admission. And for others who refused to believe, to them the keys locked the door to eternal life. That, that's what Jesus is talking about here. The keys of the kingdom aren't about Peter or any subsequent pope having the right to declare by their own authority who gets into heaven and who doesn't. It is about the gospel. The gospel is the key to entering the kingdom of heaven. When Peter preaches Jesus in Acts 2, he's wielding the keys. When Peter declares in Acts 4, verse 12, that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, he's wielding the keys. And for those who believe to them, the door is unlocked. So Eric Alexander says the gospel is the key to entering the kingdom. It is as simple as that. In Matthew 16, when Jesus talks about the keys of the kingdom, he speaks in the singular. He speaks to Peter as a representative of the apostles. The other use of the word church is also the other, another passage in Matthew 18, verse 18, where Jesus uses almost identical language about binding and loosing. But there he speaks in the plural. He speaks to all the apostles. So it's obvious that Peter wields keys, holds keys, but not as a lone emissary of Jesus. The keys are not Peter's exclusively. When Peter proclaims the gospel, as he does at Pentecost, he uses the keys to the kingdom to open the door to heaven to everyone who believes in the good news of Jesus Christ. That same message, when refused, turns the key and locks the door. That's how the gospel works, not just for Peter when he proclaims it, but for everyone in this assembly of believers that is the church, as we fulfill our great commission calling to declare the gospel to all nations, we do not open or close the door on our own authority, but the message we bear as his ambassadors, the message of the gospel, when it is believed, the door to the kingdom of heaven swings open. This is the work of the church. It is the work we have been given by Jesus as his ecclesia, his church, his assembly, his congregation. As the church fulfills its calling, it is the permanent prevailing church. Let me close with a very short illustration. Around the year 1930, Lord John Reef, uh, he spoke to a group of young executives in the BBC, that is the British broadcasting company. He was a, Lord Reith was a large, imposing man, and he comes upon these executives, and he sees them at work on a task. What are they doing? Well, they tell him that in mockery, they were attempting to write an obituary for the church. But Lord Reith, as a Christian, just looked them in the eye with his imposing stature and said, gentlemen, the church of Jesus Christ will stand at the grave of the BBC. My friends, the one institution that will stand when everything else is collapsed is the church of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that 
you've caused us to be born again into the church. Help us to understand properly what that means and to just so appreciate things like corporate worship, corporate fellowship, corporate prayer. These are things that, that the church is, is to be known for. The church is to be an example of, an illustration of to a lost and dying world. Lord, I am so grateful for the church that you are building. I'm so grateful that it's not my church. I would do nothing but ruin it. It's not my church, it's your church, but I'm delighted to just be a, a small stone in the building you are building. Lord, thank you for your church. May we eagerly participate in it and delight in our brothers and sisters who are part of it. Help us to see the church the right way as you see it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now hear the Lord's benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen and amen. Go in peace.